Now, in doing the numerical calculations, we made the assumption that the acceleration remained constant during each time step, each 0 0.1 of a second. Now, that's not quite right. So our answer is not going to be precisely right. It's going to be ever so slightly wrong. So in this video, I'd like to ask, how wrong is it likely to be, and is that a problem? So let's think this through. Let's imagine we plot velocity against time for one time step, so that might be up to three seconds, and that might be 3.1 seconds. Now the velocity is negative, might be zero up the top here, and so it's going to become more negative. It's going to go down here somewhere. Now because we've assumed that the acceleration is constant over the time step, that means we've basically assumed that we have a straight line here because constant means uh, the slope is the same all the way through. So what we do is at this particular point we work out what the forces are, what the drag force is and the gravitational force, the difference between them gives us the acceleration, i.e. the slope of this graph, and then we just come down here and that's our estimate for what the velocity at the end of our time step is. However, in reality, once you're after 3 seconds, up to 3.01, 3.02 seconds, you go a little bit faster which means there's a little bit more drag, which means the acceleration is going to be slightly less. So in fact the slope is going to ever so slightly decrease. It's probably going to look something more like this. It's going to curve upwards ever so slightly. I don't think I drew that very well. Start off the same and curl upwards. So the real velocity at the end is going to be a little bit less negative than what we calculated using our assumption of constant acceleration. Not too bad by itself, but then what's going to happen is we're going to do our next time step, say going from 3.1 to 3.2 seconds. And there'll be, there'll be a new slope we calculate, which will be less than the old slope. It might be something like this. So we'll now say our velocity is here. But in reality, we should be starting from here and allowing for the fact that it's going to curve. So as time goes on, the gap between our numerical solution and the real solution is going to get wider and wider and wider. Now in this diagram I've grossly exaggerated the discrepancy between the two, but nonetheless there is going to be a difference. How big is this difference? Well the way to test this is to try shrinking the time step. If instead of jumping all the way from 3.1, 3 to 3.1 second we go 3.01, 3.02 and so on all the way through, then we're breaking this up to lots of much smaller steps that's going to make it much more close to the real answer. So what I did was I calculated and wrote down here in this table, I changed dt. What I'm calculating here is what is the velocity at the end of five seconds, assuming you don't hit the ground. So here what I did was I just had one five second step and using that we had a velocity of minus 49 meters per second at the end. So that's really ignoring wind resistance altogether. Then I dropped it down to two and a half seconds, so that means we needed two two and a half second steps. Now it calculates a velocity of minus 38.49, which indeed is less. So that's telling us that if you try and go all the way from the start to the finish in one step, you get that speed. If you do it in two steps, you might go there, and then you might go there, so you get minus 38, which is going to be more accurate. Then if you go to 1, time step delta t of 1, that means you've got 5 steps over. Now your answer is minus 34. So that would be doing something like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But what you can see is the gaps are getting smaller. So it's a big jump from minus 49 to minus 38. It's a smaller gap from minus 38 to minus 34. If I then change dt delta t to half, so it now takes us 10 steps to get there, it only changes from 34 to 33. If I drop it down to 0 0.2, 32.68, 0 0.1, which is what we actually use, it's minus 32.74. So now it's all getting pretty close. It looks like the answer is somewhere about minus 32, and as you get smaller and smaller, it's not making much difference. What you can do with the modern computer is make it much smaller. So what I then went on is change it to 0 0.01, 0 0.001, 0 0.0001, 0 0.0001, 0 0.0001, 0 0.0001, and so on. And what you can see is, as you make the time step smaller and smaller, the answers become very similar. 
So we went from 32.74, 32.37, 32.335, 32.334, 32 32.334. So by the time you're down at about 0.001 of a second, the answers are not really differing very much to several decimal places. So we can be pretty confident that the answer is very close to minus 32.3343. Maybe there's still some error at the 6th or 7th decimal, pl decimal place, but we seem to have nailed the answer pretty accurately. So that's in general how you check this numerical method. What you do is you make your time step smaller and you look for where your answer no longer changes very much as you make the time step smaller still. And that's pretty easy now. Um, running even this one with four decimal places still took a fraction of a second. The only time I actually had to wait while the program calculated it was down here when I had uh, five zeros in front of the one. And you can see four zeros in front of the one is quite enough. So what that's telling us is that the answer is actually extremely accurate. Even where we used 0.1 of a second, we were within 1% of the right answer. We should probably, if we cared, have added another one or two zeros. It's still going to work in a fraction of a second, and that will give us an answer good to 0.001% or better. So that's how you check these things. There are other ways to make your calculation more accurate. One way, if we go back here, what we've assumed is that the slope of this line was equal to the gradient at the beginning. But we could also calculate what the gradient is at the end here, which is what we used in this part over there, and we could said, OK, 0.1 of a second from now, what's the gradient going to be? And let's extrapolate forward using that later gradient, and that will get us an answer like this. Then we could maybe average that, which is going to be systematically too high. If we average the two, that would give us a very good approximation to the correct answer. So this is an algorithm, it's called the Newton-Raphson algorithm. Raphson came up with it in the early 20th century and then discovered that Newton had invented it in some of his unpublished notes a couple of hundred years earlier. Damn that Newton guy, far too smart. So if we do something like that, and there are numerous other permutations, there's something called the runge cutter method. People spend their lives working on better methods to solve these things because it's what most of the world's supercomputers spend most of their time doing. And so you can get it so that each step is more accurate, which means you can get away with longer steps. On the other hand, given how fast computers are nowadays, you might as well just live with a less accurate method for each step and make the time step smaller, and that will still get you a very accurate answer. This whole trade-off between having a more complicated calculation for each time step versus just making the time step smaller is one that many people spend their lives working on. There's a trade-off. If you have a more complicated time step, then taking each time step takes longer to calculate. For example, we uh, used that uh, delta x equals v naught delta t plus half a naught delta t squared. But as delta t is very small, this is going to be a small term, but this has got a small squared, so this is probably going to be very, very tiny compared to that. So what you could choose to do is just ignore that. Basically assume the change in position is just the starting velocity times the change in time and ignore the acceleration over that time. This is going to make each time step less accurate. But whenever the computer calculates this, to calculate this just has to do one multiplication. It has to take this number out of the memory register, that number out, and multiply them together. If you want to calculate all of this, you've actually got five multiplications you want to do. So doing the full calculation will take your computer five times longer than just doing one multiplication. So if we get rid of this term, sure, each time step is less accurate, but we can do five times more of them. And it could well be that making each step five times shorter more than compensates for uh, the uh, extra accuracy here, or maybe it doesn't. These sort of trade-offs are what people who do numeric analysis spend a lot of their time doing, and there are good odds you may spend a lot of your life doing it in future, and there are more courses at ANU that cover these things in great detail in later years.